Imagine waking up to a nightmare that feels all too real or an unknown predator lurks in the shadows, spreading fear throughout entire communities. Today, we're diving into the chilling story of Carl Eugene Watts, a ruthless killer who eluded the law for years, leaving behind a trail of horrific crimes. Who was this man, and how did he manage to stay one step ahead of investigators for so long? Get ready, because this is a story that will send shivers down your spine and make you question everything you think you know about true evil. On Sunday, May 23, 1982, 20-year-old Michelle Mayday heard a knock at her apartment door in Houston. When she opened it, a strange and suspicious-looking man stood before her. Without warning, the stranger attacked her. He beat and choked her until she lost consciousness. As she lay helpless on the floor, the man calmly filled her bathtub with water and then drowned her before fleeing the scene. Later, the attacker admitted that he felt no emotion when he took her life. His only fear was getting caught. Lori Lister, 21, left her boyfriend's home that same day and headed back to her apartment in Houston. She parked her car and walked toward the entrance, unaware that she was being followed. As Lori pulled out her key and approached the stairs, a man wearing a red hooded sweatshirt suddenly appeared behind her. He choked her, leaving her semi-conscious. In an interview with Fox News in August 2002, Lori described how, in that moment, she didn't pray for her life but hoped her body would be found. She was certain she would die. However, Lori managed to let out a small scream. Her neighbors heard the muffled cry and immediately called the police. Meanwhile, the attacker dragged Lori up the stairs to her apartment, where he encountered her roommate, 18-year-old Melinda Aguilar. The attacker threatened to kill Melinda if she made a sound, then choked her until she went limp. He thought she was unconscious, but Melinda was only pretending. He tied her hands behind her back using hangers and did the same to Lori, tying her hands and feet. Overcome with excitement, the attacker began jumping up and down in celebration, thrilled to have control over the two women. While Melinda lay in the bedroom, the intruder went to the bathroom and filled the tub with water. Melinda seized the opportunity and leaped from the second-story balcony, screaming for help. She hoped it wasn't too late to save Lori. Moments later, police arrived. The intruder heard the sirens and tried to escape, but he was caught in the apartment complex courtyard. The neighbor who had alerted the police ran into Lori's apartment and found her with her head submerged in the bathtub. Fortunately, Lori survived, narrowly escaping death. The attacker was identified as Carl Carl Eugene Watts, a 29-year-old mechanic from Houston. When questioned about his actions, Watts claimed that the women had evil eyes and that he needed to release their spirits. In a shocking admission, he confessed to being responsible for as many as 80 murders. Before being sent to prison, Watts made a chilling declaration, if they ever let me out, I'll kill again. Investigators had no doubt he meant it. Carl had lost all control over his violent urges and believed that killing was the only way to find happiness. In the early 1950s, Richard Watts from Colwood, West Virginia, married his young sweetheart, Dorothy May Young. Shortly after their wedding, the couple moved to Killeen, Texas, where Richard was stationed at Fort Hood Army Base. On November 7, 1953, they welcomed their first child, Carl Eugene Watts. Just days after his birth, the family returned to their hometown in West Virginia, and a year later, their second child, Sharon, was born. Unfortunately, Richard and Dorothy May had a troubled marriage, and they divorced in 1955. After the split, Dorothy May moved with her two children to Inkster, Michigan, where she took a job as a high school art teacher. Despite the move, the family often returned to Colwood to visit relatives. According to a 1991 article in the Houston Chronicle by Evan Moore, Carl loved the rural surroundings of his grandmother's house, where he learned to hunt and skin rabbits, an activity he thoroughly enjoyed. His fondness for the southern town eventually led him to change his name to Coral, a southern pronunciation of Carl. In 1962, Carl's mother remarried, this time to an Inkster mechanic, and the couple had two more children together. Carl struggled to adjust to his new family situation and didn't get along with his stepfather. It's possible that Carl feared losing his mother's attention during this time. At age 8, Carl developed meningitis, a severe illness that nearly killed him. According to Moore, his fever was so high that doctors worried it might have caused slight brain damage. Carl missed a year of school due to the illness and was never quite the same after that. 
When Carl returned to school in Inkster, he had to repeat a grade to make up for what he missed during his illness. He struggled to keep up with his classmates, and his grades dropped. It was unclear whether this was due to possible brain damage from his meningitis or from chronic sleep problems that began after the illness. Carl started having violent dreams that disrupted his sleep. In these dreams, he fought off what he believed were the evil spirits of women, trying to kill them. According to Evan Moore, these were nightmares to Carl, because he enjoyed them. At the age of 15, Carl felt compelled to act out his dreams. One day, while delivering papers, he knocked on the door of Joan Gave, a 26-year-old woman. When she answered, Carl, who was unusually strong for his age, violently attacked her. Afterward, he calmly continued his paper route as if nothing had happened. Joan Gave immediately called the police, and Carl was arrested at his home. He was ordered to undergo psychiatric treatment at the Lafayette Clinic in Detroit. During his evaluation, Carl spoke about his disturbing dreams. When asked if they bothered him, he chillingly responded, No, I feel better after I have one. This response raised significant concerns about his mental health. According to the Dallas Observer, the psychiatrist reported that Carl was an impulsive individual with a passive-aggressive orientation to life and struggling to control strong homicidal impulses. The doctor believed Carl posed a serious threat to society. Despite these concerns, the psychiatrist hoped that outpatient treatment could help. On his 16th birthday, Carl was released from the clinic. Over time, he returned to the clinic for psychiatric treatment about nine more times. In the meantime, Carl went back to high school. Though his academic performance remained poor, he excelled in sports. Athletics became an outlet for his aggression. He became a star football player and was even more successful in boxing, earning the status of a Golden Gloves fighter. With the help of his mother's tutoring, Carl managed to graduate from high school at the age of 19. Despite his low grades, he received a football scholarship to Lane College in Jackson, Tennessee. However, after a few months, Carl suffered minor leg injuries and decided to leave school, returning home to his mother. After working as a mechanic for a year in Detroit, Carl enrolled at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo. Soon after, a series of violent attacks began in the area surrounding the campus, many of which ended in murder. On October 25, 1974, 23-year-old Lenore Nizaki heard a knock at her door. When she answered, a young black man stood before her, asking for someone named Charles. Before Lenore knew what was happening, the man began strangling her. She managed to fight him off, and he fled the apartment. Lenore quickly called the police, but they were unable to apprehend the attacker. Just five days later, on October 30th, 19-year-old Gloria Steele also received a knock on her apartment door in Kalamazoo. A man was again asking for someone named Charles. When Steele let the man inside, he viciously attacked her with a knife, stabbing her 33 times. According to reports, the same man attempted another attack on November 12th. This time, the woman managed to fend him off. As the assailant fled the scene, the woman was able to catch a glimpse of his license plate. She gave the information to the police, who traced the car back to Carl Eugene Watts. Carl was arrested in December for assault and battery after the two surviving women identified him in a police lineup. During questioning, Carl confessed to attacking at least a dozen more women, but he never admitted to the murder of Gloria Steele. Before his court hearing, Carl was ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation at Kalamazoo State Hospital. Psychiatrists determined that Carl lacked remorse for his actions and was impulsive, reckless, and emotionally detached. Despite these findings, they did not believe he suffered from psychosis. He was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, which explained his lack of empathy and disregard for societal norms. While staying at the mental hospital, Carl fell into a temporary depression and attempted suicide by hanging himself with a cord. Fortunately, the attempt failed leaving him with only minor injuries. In the summer of 1975, Carl was re-evaluated by psychiatrists. They confirmed that he was suffering from depression and posed a danger to himself and others. Despite his ongoing behavioral problems, he was found fit to stand trial for the assaults. Carl was eventually sentenced to just one year in jail. Unfortunately, due to insufficient evidence, he never stood trial for the murder of Gloria Steele.
Carl was released from jail in the summer of 1976, ready to continue his deadly campaign against women. Upon his release, Carl found work as a mechanic and moved back home with his mother. Many saw him as a mama's boy, as he never liked being away from her for long periods. She was perhaps the only person who truly understood him. Not long after Carl's release, he began dating a woman named Dolores. They had a child together, but never married. Eventually, the couple split and Carl started a new relationship with a woman named Valeria. They got married in 1979, but the marriage only lasted six months. In a police interview years later, Valeria revealed that Carl's behavior had become increasingly erratic during their short time together. According to Evan Moore, Valeria described how Carl would have violent nightmares and became careless, leaving clothes and even garbage scattered around the house. He would also cut up houseplants with a knife and melt candles onto the furniture. Stranger still, after they had sex, Carl would immediately leave the house for hours at a time. Larry Werner, in his 2002 Star Tribune article, speculated that Carl was likely stalking new victims during these absences. Over the course of a year, several women were attacked and murdered. One of them was Jean Klein, a 44-year-old Detroit news reporter, who was attacked on Halloween Day in 1979. She was walking home from a doctor's appointment along a busy suburban road in Gross Point Farms when she was assaulted in broad daylight. Jean died from 11 stab wounds. Unfortunately, police were unable to gather any evidence leading to a suspect. Initially, detectives suspected Jean's husband, but he was later cleared when Carl confessed to her murder. It's unclear if Carl attacked any other women between Jean's murder and his divorce in May 1980. No evidence surfaced connecting him to any further crimes during that period, but given his history, it's possible he committed more assaults. On April 20, 1980, 17-year-old high school student Shirley Small was stabbed to death outside her home in Ann Arbor, Michigan. She was attacked twice in the heart. That summer, a similar attack occurred against Glenda Richmond, a 26-year-old diner manager, outside her home in the Ann Arbor area. She was found with 28 stab wounds to her chest. In both cases, there was not enough evidence to identify a suspect, but the murders had Carl's hallmark. Then, on September 14, University of Michigan graduate student Rebecca Huff, 20, was found brutally murdered outside her home. She had been stabbed approximately 50 times. This case was unique because it was one of the first murders directly linked to Coral and led to one of an Arbor's largest murder investigations. It took two months before authorities connected Coral to Rebecca's murder. Three murders of young women in Ann Arbor over the course of five months spread fear across the normally peaceful college town. Paul Bunton, a felony investigator with the Ann Arbor Police, made it his mission to catch the killer, who was quickly dubbed the Sunday Morning Slasher by local newspapers. Bunton led a dedicated task force that immediately increased patrols in and around the town, hoping to prevent more tragedies and catch the murderer. Then, on November 15, Bunton's team got a break. At around 5 a.m., two officers patrolling near Main Street noticed a man in a car slowly following a woman who was walking home. Realizing she was being pursued, the woman tried to hide in a doorway, hoping the man would give up. Many residents were on edge because of the recent murders, and she likely feared for her life. According to Moore, Bunton later remarked that Coral, the man who had been following her, almost went nuts when he couldn't find her again. The officers pulled over Coral's car and arrested him for driving with expired plates and a suspended license. During their search, they found a couple of screwdrivers and a box of wood filing tools. But the most significant find was a dictionary with the etched words Rebecca is a lover, which belonged to Rebecca Huff, one of the murder victims. This was a major clue linking Coral to the crime, but it still wasn't enough to secure a conviction. Bunton and his team placed Coral under constant surveillance, tracking his every move with a device hidden under his car. They were certain he was responsible for the deaths of Small, Richmond, and Huff, now they just needed the proof. Carl seemed to realize he was being watched and managed to suppress his violent urges for two months. With no further evidence, the police had to call off the surveillance. They brought Coral in for questioning instead. Bunton interrogated him for about nine hours, but Coral refused to cooperate. At one point, however, Bunton described in graphic detail how the women had been murdered, and Coral unexpectedly broke down in tears. It was the first real emotion the police had seen from him. 
Bunton later recalled that Carl was soft-spoken and shy, almost agreeable if you could forget the monstrous acts he was suspected of committing. Eventually, due to a lack of concrete evidence, Carl was released from police custody. At the time, he was suspected of at least two attempted murders and potentially linked to five others in the Detroit area. By the spring of 1981, Carl had moved to Columbus, Texas, where he found work at an oil company. On weekends, he drove over 70 miles to Houston, a city that would soon become his new hunting ground. After Carl Watts moved to Texas, Paul Bunton made sure to send Carl's criminal files to the Houston police, hoping to prevent more murders. Houston authorities managed to locate Carl, but despite suspicions that he was involved in several murder cases, they couldn't gather enough evidence to arrest him for any homicides. According to Pam Easton's November 2002 Associated Press article, Houston Homicide Sergeant Tom Ladd explained that Carl's elusive methods made building a case difficult. He never sexually assaulted his victims chose strangers and used varying methods to kill, which left little evidence behind. His attacks were quick, and he was often killed within minutes of meeting his victims. But everything changed after the brutal attack on Lori Lister and Melinda Aguilar in May 1982. Following this, Harris County Assistant District Attorney Ira Jones came up with a plan to prompt Coral into confessing, offer him immunity for his murders in exchange for information. On August 9, 1982, Coral was offered the deal and agreed. A few days later, he led investigators to the burial sites of three of his victims. Ultimately, Coral confessed to attacking 19 women, 13 of whom he admitted to murdering. Carl told police he was responsible for the 1979 Detroit murder of Jean Klein but didn't confess to killing an Arbor victim's Glenda Richmond, Shirley Small, or Rebecca Hoff, even though Hoff's dictionary was found in his possession. However, Carl was more open about his Houston crimes. He confessed to drowning 22-year-old University of Texas student Linda Tilly in a swimming pool and admitted to stabbing 25-year-old Elizabeth Montgomery to death just a week later. That same day, Carl also murdered his cousin Susan Wolf, stabbing her to death as she returned home with ice cream. In January 1982, Carl murdered 27-year-old Phyllis Tam, strangling her and hanging her body from a tree with an elastic strap while she was out jogging. He also admitted to killing architecture student Margaret Fossey two days later by delivering a fatal blow to her throat. Carl would often steal items from his victims and burn them in an attempt to kill the spirit. His justification for the murders was his belief that the women possessed evil eyes. Among his confessions, Carl admitted to slashing the throats of multiple women in Houston and stabbing another with an ice pick, all of whom survived. Between February and May 1982, he also confessed to murdering Elena Samander, Emily Lacqua, Anna Ledette, Yolanda Gracia, Carrie Jefferson, Suzanne Searles, and Michelle Mayday, along with attacking three other women. In total, Carl confessed to at least 80 more murders in Michigan and Canada, though he refused to provide details as he had not been granted immunity for those crimes. Ultimately, Carl's plea deal worked in his favor. He pled guilty to a single count of burglary with intent to kill and received a 60-year prison sentence. Before he left for prison, Carl chillingly told an investigator, You know, if they ever let me out, I'll kill again. Several months after Carl Watts was imprisoned, he attempted a bold escape. Creasing himself with hair gel, he tried to slip through his jail cell window but got stuck, thwarting his plan. Afterward, Carl pursued a legal escape route by appealing his sentence. In 1989, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals reviewed Carl's case. Moore reported that the judge had failed to inform Carl that the bathtub water he used to attempt to drown Lori Lister was considered a lethal weapon. Because of this oversight, Carl was no longer required to serve his full sentence. He was reclassified as a nonviolent inmate, allowing him to earn good time credits for his behavior in prison. Under Texas old mandatory law, the good time policy provided sentence reductions based on good behavior. With his reclassification, Carl was granted two to three days of sentence reduction for every day served, effectively cutting his sentence by more than half. Despite having admitted to a desire to kill again if released, Carl Watts was set for release on May 9, 2006 making him one of the first confessed serial killers in U.S. history to be legally freed. The news of Carl's early release horrified his surviving victims, the families of the women he murdered, and the public. They were fully aware of his chilling promise to resume his killing spree. Laurie Lister, one of his surviving victims, expressed feelings of betrayal, 
stating that she had believed Coral would be locked away for life. She, like many others, felt misled and unprotected by the law. The idea of his impending release caused widespread outrage and fear. Due to Coral's nonviolent classification, he also became eligible for parole. However, the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles rejected his release six times between 1990 and 2004. In response to Coral's potential release in 2006, Michigan and Texas authorities ramped up efforts to reopen cold cases. They hoped that advances in DNA testing, which were unavailable in the 1980s, might provide the evidence needed to link Coral to additional murders. Law enforcement was determined to prevent Coral Watt's release, recognizing the threat he posed to society. There was little doubt among the authorities, the public, or the victim's families that Coral would kill again if given the chance. Finally, 22 years after Coral Watt's initial sentencing, new evidence emerged that linked him to another murder. In 2004, Joseph Foy came forward with crucial testimony, claiming that he had witnessed Coral murder a woman in December 1979. Foy responded to an appeal on a popular television news program that sought information about Coral's crimes. Immediately, Foy contacted the police and recounted what he had seen approximately 25 years earlier. According to Whitley's March 2004 Dallas Observer article, Foy, then 45 years old, told authorities he had witnessed 36-year-old Helen May Dutcher being attacked in an alley outside a Ferndale dry cleaner. Dutcher was struggling with a man who repeatedly stabbed her in the neck and back. Tragically, she died moments later from 12 stab wounds. At the time of the attack, Foy had reported what he had seen, and a composite sketch of the attacker was drawn. However, despite an investigation, the authorities were unable to identify the killer, and the case was shelved. Years later, in 1982, Foy watched a television program about Carl Watts and called the police again, convinced that Watts was the man he had seen. But as Whitley reported, the authorities dismissed the lead, assuming that Carl Watts would die in prison and that pursuing the Dutcher investigation was unnecessary. They had not accounted for the possibility of his early release under the good time policy. In January 2004, after watching MSNBC's The Abrams Report cover Carl Watts' case, Foy was compelled to reach out to the police once more. This time, his story gave authorities the breakthrough they needed to block Carl's early release. Carl Watts was officially charged with Helen May Dutcher's murder. Michigan Governor Jennifer Granholm initiated proceedings to extradite Carl to Michigan to stand trial. If convicted, Carl would face a mandatory life sentence without parole, a punishment many believe was long overdue and the least he deserved. In April 2004, Carl Eugene Watts was extradited from Texas to Pontiac, Michigan, to stand trial for the 1979 murder of Helen Dutcher. During the arraignment, his defense attorney, Ronald Kaplowitz, entered a plea of not guilty. If convicted of Dutcher's murder, Watts faced a mandatory life sentence since Michigan does not have the death penalty. However, if acquitted, authorities in Texas had enough evidence to charge Watts with the murder of 14-year-old Emily Lakewa, whose strangled body had been found in 1982. Watts' trial began in November 2004 at the Oakland County Circuit Court and was expected to last two to three weeks. Despite attempts by the defense to exclude key evidence, Judge Richard Kuhn allowed Watts' past confessions to be presented, as they revealed a disturbing pattern of behavior. The prosecution, led by Assistant Attorney General Donna Pendergast, brought forth several key witnesses, including Joseph Foy, who had witnessed Dutcher's murder, and three surviving victims who had lived to tell their harrowing stories. On November 15, the jury heard powerful testimony from Julie Sanchez, who recounted how Watts had attacked her in January 1982. Watts had slashed her throat and stabbed her multiple times before leaving her for dead on the side of a Texas highway. Her chilling testimony was followed by that of Melinda Aguilar and Lori Lister, Watts' last known victims. They described how Watts had sadistically enjoyed their suffering during the brutal attack. Aguilar even recalled pretending to be dead, only to see Watts celebrate by clapping his hands in twisted delight. Joseph Foy's testimony was pivotal. He recounted how he had seen Watts attack Dutcher, describing the killer's face as devoid of soul, feeling, or remorse. Despite challenges from the defense, who questioned whether Foy could have seen the murderer clearly from 80 feet away on a night, his account remained compelling, especially given the similarities between the composite sketch he had provided and Watts' appearance. After closing arguments on November 16, the jury began deliberations. 
Two days later, on November 18th, they returned a verdict. Carl Watts was found guilty of first-degree murder. Watts reacted with disdain, rolling his eyes and shaking his head, while the victim's families celebrated, finally feeling some semblance of justice. Watts was sentenced to life in prison, but his life would be shorter than expected. On September 21, 2007, at 53 years old, Carl Eugene Watts died in a Michigan hospital from prostate cancer. His death came just two months after a jury convicted him for the 1974 murder of Western Michigan University student Gloria Steele. Reflecting on Watts' death, Carol Tilly, the mother of one of his victims, Linda Tilly, told Star-Telegram, we feel like it helps to close the book on this. It's never over. But it helps. As we delve deeper into the terrifying tale of Carl Eugene Watts, we find ourselves left with more questions than answers about the true essence of evil. His ability to evade capture for so long, paired with the brutality of his crimes, paints a chilling portrait of a man seemingly devoid of conscience. What compels someone to commit such monstrous acts? As we continue to explore the darkest corners of the human mind, we invite you to join us on this haunting journey. If you found this story as unsettling as we did, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. There are many more disturbing stories to come, and you won't want to miss them. Thank you for watching, and remember, sometimes, the scariest monsters are the ones we least expect.